Hello there, and welcome to this first in a series of reflections, meditations here on EWTN, intended to help us all to enter more fully into this beautiful season of Advent. My name is Father Joseph Ralph, and I'm a Dominican, and I welcome you to the beautiful St. Catherine's Church here in Uri in the north of Ireland. Over the next few weeks, you are invited to journey together with us, the Irish Dominicans, as we make our way through this beautiful season. Each week, we will pause at the watering wells of God's Word in sacred scripture and drink there from the fountains of his wisdom and his love. We will begin with prayer of Psalm 32, which captures very powerfully, I think, the mood and the atmosphere of this beautiful season of Advent. Let us pray. The Lord delights in those who revere him, in those who wait on his love, to rescue their souls from death, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul is waiting for the Lord. The Lord is our help and our shield. In him our hearts find joy. We trust in his holy name. May your love be upon us, O Lord, as we place all our hope in you. The season of Advent touches into a basic and central experience of human life, the experience of waiting. The truth is that we are always awaiting people individually and collectively. We're waiting on God, for God to, for his saving promises to become flesh more and more in our lives and in our world. We're waiting on each other for greater healing, harmony and reconciliation and fraternity in our relationships. We're waiting on ourselves to realize our potential to become all that we can be, to become all that God has intended us to be. Yes, Christ has already come in Jesus of Nazareth. Christ will come again at the end of the world, what we refer to as his second coming. But even now, in this in-between time, we wait for Christ to come more fully into our lives and into our world, that his saving presence might become more manifest in our lives today. We wait on God, some of us, to save us from sickness, from affliction, from addiction, from darkness of one kind or another. We wait for the church to rise again from the tomb of scandal and abuse and become a more humble and authentic witness to the presence of Jesus in the world today. We wait for the coming of his kingdom, for our world to become more and more the kind of place that God longs for it to be, where human dignity is everywhere respected from the womb to the tomb, where the poor and the marginalized of society are brought center stage, where there is welcome for the migrant and the stranger, where there is acceptance and respect for those who are different, where solidarity and fraternity become the norm of human relations, where respect and reverence for the environment is embraced by everybody. Yes, we wait too for nature to herald in a new springtime, for the return of daylight, for the sight of the first snowdrop, for the earth to warm up. Yes, we wait on each other too. We wait for others, don't we, to fulfill their promises. We wait for our beloved children to realize their potential, to blossom in life, in their relationships, in their work. We wait too for the one who has wandered away from home, perhaps, to come back into relationship, back into friendship. We wait for reconciliation with those with whom 
we have become estranged. And we wait for ourselves in a real sense too, still struggling to come to terms with aspects of our past, still struggling to rise above our human weakness, still struggling to realize our own potential. But we live, as you know, in a culture that doesn't like to wait. Waiting is a really negative word in modern life. Society is driven by consumption and compulsion and a determination to satisfy our needs and our wants immediately. This instant, now, if not sooner, we're driven by a desire for everything sooner, for faster food, faster broadband, faster means of communication, and instant gratification. Waiting is viewed as something negative. We resent waiting. We complain, how could you keep me waiting? It's considered to be a time when nothing is happening, a desert time, empty, a waste of valuable time. But not so in sacred scripture and not so in our Christian tradition. Here, waiting is presented and understood to be an opportunity for growth, to grow spiritually, to grow in love, love of God, love of neighbor, and love of our true self. In the scripture of Advent, the church presents us with models of waiting People who know how to wait, trustingly, patiently, hopefully, for the fullness of what is to come, for God to fulfill his promises. Through the word of scripture, the Spirit of God seeks to nourish our hope, to deepen our trust, and to stretch our patience as we wait for God to come and to fulfill his promises more fully today. There is a prayer from the communion rite of the Mass which captures this atmosphere of Advent very beautifully. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day that with your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from every distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And you know, this is what characterizes our Christian waiting. We know that something has already begun. Christ is already here. And we're waiting for that which has already started to become more manifest, to show itself more fully, to fulfill its promise. If you like, the seed has been sown. The word is already in the womb. We know by faith that it is there, and now we wait full of confidence for its fuller manifestation today. In the season of Advent, we celebrate a particular stage in the life of Jesus, the presence of Jesus in the womb of Mary. Mary knew he was there, Elizabeth knew he was there, Joseph knew he was there, and together they waited for the presence of Jesus in the womb to grow and develop, to become more and more manifest in her body. And they looked forward to the day when he would show himself to the world. But we recognize that not only is that a stage in the life of Jesus in the past, but it is a way in which Jesus continues to be present among us today. It is the one way in which we continue to experience Jesus present today, with us, but not yet visible. With us, but not yet tangible. His presence is real, but still an object of hope. He's with us, yes, but not yet experienced by our senses. Already with us, and yet still to come. The tiny embryo is in the womb, but not yet showing. It is the experience of the psalmist who cried out, you are a God who lies hidden. 
we are a people who recognize Jesus present among us, but still hidden, concealed, and we're waiting for him to become more fully present in our lives. How true that experience of God is in all of our lives, particularly for those of us who find ourselves in places of darkness and distress just now. Suffering humanity, crying out in pain, how long, O Lord, how long have we to wait? How long before the dawn, before liberation, before we see your face? Perhaps this is an appropriate moment for us to begin to open up the gospel for the first Sunday in Advent. From the Holy Gospel, according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, as it was in Noah's day, so will it be when the Son of Man comes. For in those days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, taking wives, taking husbands, right up to the day that Noah went into the ark. And they suspected nothing till the flood came and swept it all away. It will be like this when the Son of Man comes. Then of two men in the fields, one will be taken, one left. Of two women at the millstone grinding, one taken, one left. So stay awake, because you do not know the day when your master is coming. You may be quite sure of this, that if the householder had known at what time of the night the burglar would come, he would have stayed awake and would not have allowed the burglar to break through the wall of his house. Therefore, you too must stay awake and stand ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, join us in a few moments when we will continue our journey with the gospel for the first Sunday of Advent. So welcome back, friends, to week one of our Advent Reflection series. On the first Sunday in Advent, we always hear a passage about the early Christian community waiting for the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. The gospel today belongs to the genre of ap apocalyptic literature. In colorful and figurative language, Jesus describes the end times, the end of the world, images of turmoil and distress, bewilderment and confusion, sudden and unexpected loss. And yet in the midst of it all, the exhortation to stay awake and the reassurance of the coming of the Son of Man, God coming to save, to rescue, to deliver, to restore. At the time of preaching this message, Jesus was at a critical moment in his own life journey. He was in Jerusalem, Passover time. His own death was imminent. No doubt his heart was troubled and distressed at what lay ahead. Yet these images speak tellingly of his situation his earthly life was about to come to an end. His physical strength was about to be crushed. His community to disperse. His friends to abandon him. And yet he waited in trust. Courageous trust and hope that the Father would not let him down. That the Father's love and not death would have the last word on his life. In the wider context of the passage, 
we know that Matthew wrote these words about 85 AD. The early Christian communities would have already witnessed or heard about Nero's persecution of their brothers and sisters. The death of Peter and Paul, two giants of the early Christian church, would have left them very troubled and anxious about the future. And then the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem would have undermined their Jewish heritage. Against this backdrop of loss and suffering, Matthew wrote this passage, seeking to reassure the early Christian communities that God had not abandoned them, that God was in their midst, and that very soon he would make his presence felt, exhorting them to stay awake, not to lose heart, to wait with hope and trust for the emerging victory of God's love, to stand ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour they do not expect. How do we enter into this passage today? By remembering our own end of the world experiences, what seemed to be the end of the world for us when the floods came and swept it all away suddenly and unexpectedly, and we were left bewildered by the uncertainty and the unpredictability of human life. One taken, one left, overwhelmed by a sense of helplessness in the face of human tragedy and vulnerability, not knowing when the burglar of the house would break through the wall of our house. Perhaps it was the experience of the loss of a loved one, a spouse, a child, a sibling, a parent, and the bottom fell out of our lives. Perhaps it was the experience of being diagnosed with serious illness, and we were plunged into the most dreadful fear and apprehension. Or the experience of failure or humiliation from which we felt we would never get up or an experience of rejection and betrayal that left us desolate, abandoned, even homeless, or as a church, demoralized and discouraged by allegations of abuse and cowardly cover-up, and we were greatly disillusioned and disenchanted by our church, or living through the experience of natural disaster, floodings, hurricanes, earthquake, which left us desolate and derelict, and we felt it was the end. And then, in the midst of it all, in the midst of these times of crisis, the moment of grace, the first sign of the Son of Man coming to save us, empowering us to stand up, giving us courage and hope for the future, that we had a future, it might have been a warm handshake or embrace that strengthened us. A compassionate word or gesture from someone who understood where we were at, who had been there themselves and had come through and enkindled a little spark of hope in our hearts. Or the emergence of a new leader in our church or country, which heralded the dawn of a new day and the prospect of renewal and recovery, or the arrival of humanitarian aid to our homes or our shores, giving us the courage to begin to pick up the pieces and to start again. And in all of it, we surrendered to a deeper experience of faith that God was there somewhere, that God was at work in our situation, and that God's word would have the last word in it all, and that he would stay with us until the morning comes. That is what the passage refers to as staying awake, staying awake in faith, in hope, and in trust, in prayer, attentive to the early signs of God's presence and anticipating more of that presence still to come and to manifest itself. 
And just as it has been in these little end-of-the-world experiences, so will it be at the definitive end of the world. All our earthly security swept away and the Son of Man coming to save us. I remember the morning my father died, nearly 20 years ago now. It was the 25th of January at 6.30 in the morning. And as a family, we had gathered round his deathbed from the night before, and we were there when he breathed his last. Shortly after his passing, some of my siblings and I drifted out into the backyard. It was a cold and clear morning. There was a heavy frost on the ground. Then my older brother suddenly drew attention to a small snowdrop that had raised its head along the side of the path. In its littleness and fragility on that bleak January morning, when our lives were plunged in darkness, it was a reassuring sign of God's presence, of God's faithful love, a wonderful sign of hope, of promise, of a new springtime, of new life beyond death and the darkness of winter. A reminder to all of us, devastated by our grief and loss, that there is a power at work in nature and in human life, the power of God's love, a love that is greater than death, stronger than death, and a love that will conquer in the end. During this season of Advent, we listen to voices of hope in our midst. In the simple trust of my good friend Richard, as his body succumbed to a horrible cancer, who reminded me that there are times in our lives when we cannot see God, times when we cannot feel God's presence, and yet God can see us, and that's all that truly matters. Or we hear that voice of hope in the courageous words of my neighbor Sally, who cradled her stillborn child in her arms and spoke courageously of how the victory of God's love would be experienced on the other side of death. In the midst of scandal and disengagement in our church, it is the witness of those who remain faithful to the practices of our faith and keep going and keep giving of themselves, confident that a more humble and authentic people of God is already emerging. It is the hope of people like Anne Frank, who while still imprisoned in the attic in the house in Amsterdam during the horror of the Holocaust, she wrote in her diary, in spite of everything, I still believe that human beings are good at heart. I see the world being turned into a wilderness. I hear the ever approaching thunder that will destroy us too. I see the suffering of millions. And yet, when I look up into the sky, I feel that everything will turn out all right, that this cruelty will end, and that peace and tranquility will return to our world. It is the voice of Isaiah in today's first reading. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into sickles. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and there will be no more training for war. It is the voice of John the Baptist proclaiming with confidence to all in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled in, and every mountain and hill laid low. The crooked paths will be made straight and the rough places made smooth and all humankind will see the salvation of God. Hope, it has been said, means to keep living amidst the desperation and to keep humming in the darkness. It is trust in tomorrow. In the midst of a gale at the sea, it is to discover land. It in the eyes of another, it is to see that he understands you. As long as there is hope, there will also be prayer. 
and God will be holding you in his hands. Let us conclude with a prayer from Psalm 130. Let us pray. My soul is waiting for the Lord. I count on his word. My soul is longing for the Lord more than watchman for daybreak. Let the watchman count on daybreak and Israel on the Lord. Next week, friends, Father Columba, Mary Tobin, will continue our Advent series reflecting on the second week's gospel for this season of Advent. Please tune in. From everyone here in EWTN and from our Irish Dominican brethren, I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a blessed and holy season of Advent. God bless you.